There are thousands of altered states. butterflies, rainforests, that kind of thing, is this family of compounds called the indole hallucinogens. Indoles. And they cause hallucination. And some people say, you know, that I'm a fetishist about this, that who cares, or that there are other things besides hallucination. Yes, I know, maybe, and of course, but... The reason I'm so fascinated by hallucinations is because, to my mind, when you're hallucinating, you have an absolutely clear proof that you are not generating this material. You know, it's not funny ideas. It's not racing thoughts. It's not insight into what your boyfriend really meant yesterday. That kind of thing we all can generate by just inspecting our own minds. But a hallucination is to be in the presence of that which previously could not be imagined. And if it previously could not be imagined, then there is no grounds for believing that you generated it out of yourself.
know? You know what's in your cupboard. You know what's in your chest of drawers. For God's sake, you ought to know what's in your mind. Well, then if something comes forward and you say, that's not mine, that's not in my inventory, then you have a kind of perfect proof that this is coming from somewhere else. And then the question begins, becomes, where? And, and we can set off into that. Opinions differ, uh, and nobody has God's truth on it. it uh, a reductionist, somebody who didn't like these substances, would say, oh, well, it's, it's just neurological chaos. It's just you've interrupted the normal functioning of good brain chemicals, and, and evil brain chemicals are now uh, giving a, a, a sense of, of a chaos. Well, that just doesn't cut the mustard. I mean, that kind of stuff may work if you're talking to the troops, but not if you're talking to anybody who's ever been there. I know what a neurological chaos would look like. It would look like bright lights, moving patterns, colored this, something that. It would not be ruins, landscapes, machines, paintings, works of art, building plans, weapons, bits of, uh, uh, of manufactured technological detritus. These things are too coherent. They're objects in some kind of superstructure of the mind. And for me, this was the revelation. I didn't get into this business by being an airhead or a, or a screwball. My attitude was always, if it's real, it can take the pressure. You know, you don't have to pussyfoot around the real thing. If they're telling you, you know, oh, you must lower your voice and avert your gaze or this and that, then you're probably in the presence of crap. Because the real thing is real. It doesn't demand that you, you adjust your opinion to suit it. It's real. That means it is preeminent. That means it sets the agenda. And I studied yoga. I wandered around in the East. I was fast shuffled by beady-eyed little men in dotis. I know the whole spiritual supermarket and rigmarole. And, and I, I find nothing there to interest me on the level of, you know, five grams of psilocybin mushrooms in silent darkness. I mean, that's where the pedal meets the metal. That's where the rubber meets the road. And the inspiration for me to get up and talk to an audience like this simply comes from the fact that I cannot believe that this could be kept under wraps the way it has. I mean, I kidded with you earlier that they would make sex illegal if they could. Well, they can't, so it isn't. But the psychedelic experience is as central to understanding your humanness as having sex, or having a child, or having responsibilities, or, or having hopes and dreams, and yet it is illegal. We are somehow told we are infantilized. We're told, you know, you can wander around within the sanctioned playpen of ordinary consciousness. And we have some intoxicants over here. If you want to mess yourself up, we've got some scotch here and some tobacco and red meat and some sugar and a little TV and so forth and so on. Uh, but, but these boundary dissolving uh, hallucinogens that give you a sense of unity with your fellow man and nature are somehow forbidden. This is an outrage. It's a sign of cultural immaturity, and the fact that we tolerate it is a sign that we are uh, living in a society as oppressed as any society in the past. Chaque fleur 
you might imagine is a fairly ephemeral, recent, fragile phenomenon. It is not. The average star in this galaxy gutters out after about 700 million years. Not our star. We happen to have the good fortune to be around a very stable, slow-burning star. But there has been biology on this planet at least two billion years, three times the average life of a star. So biology is not some Johnny-come-lately epiphenomena. Biology is a phenomenon more persistent than the life of the stars themselves. And uh, biology is not a static thing. I mean, a star evolving now is not greatly different from a star evolving a billion years ago. Biology doesn't work that way. Biology constantly changes the context in which evolution occurs. The way I have downloaded this into a phrase is the universe is, the biological universe at least, is a novelty conserving engine. Upon simple molecules are built complex molecules. Upon complex molecules are built complex polymers. Upon complex polymers comes DNA. Out of DNA comes the whole machinery of the cell. Out of cells comes simple uh, aggregate colony animals like hydra and that sort of thing. Out of that, true animals. Out of that, ever more complex animals, organs of locomotion, organs of sight, organs of smell, complex mental machinery for the coordinating of data in time and space. I remember that day of such
species, it reaches its culmination and it crosses over into a new domain where change no longer occurs in the, in the atomic and biological machinery of existence. It begins to take place in this world which we call mental. It's called epigenetic change change which cannot be traced back to mutation of the arrangements of molecules inside long chain polymers, but change taking place in syntactical structures that are linguistically based. And people have probably been using language with considerable facility for probably 50,000 years, possibly more. Uh, in our own time, we have created ever more elaborate languages, ever more elaborate technologies for transforming, storing, and retrieving language, so that we are actually on the brink, I mean, of being able to give every single one of you the complete cultural inventory, the complete database of human beings' experience on this planet. That's what these data highways and networks are all about. The nervous system is being hardwired. But what I wanted to draw your attention to about this is it is not only an advance deeper and deeper into novelty, but it's an advance which, in which each successive stage occurs more quickly than the stage which preceded it. So, you know, once you get the Big Bang, then nothing much happens for a long, long time. I mean, there's plasma streaming through the universe. The universe is slowly cooling, but that's the most dramatic complex process in the universe, this cooling. Then, after a certain point, more complex processes come in. Complexification begins to build, and as it builds, it begins to happen faster and faster and faster. And the great puzzle in the biological record is the suddenness of our own emergence, of our emergence, human emergence, out of primate, out of the primate line. It happened with enormous suddenness. Uh, Lumholtz calls it the most explosive reorganization of a major organ of a higher animal in the entire fossil record. And that's, you know, a great embarrassment to the theory of evolution because this is the organ which generated the theory of evolution. We're not talking an appendix or an eyebrow here. We're talking the very organ which generated it. I think that we are not, that we have taken far too much responsibility for what is happening. And that what we took to be a staircase we were climbing is actually an up escalator. And if you will stop climbing, you will notice that it does not impede your upward progress because the ground you're standing on is moving you toward the goal. And I, I think that, uh, this idea, which may be the proof that I'm bonkers, requires a fairly radical reorganization of consciousness. Because what I'm saying is the universe was not born in a fiery explosion from which it's been being blasted outward ever since. The universe is not being pushed like that from behind. The universe is being pulled from the future toward a goal that is as inevitable as a, bowl, as a marble reaching the bottom of a bowl when you release it up near the rim. You know, if you do that, the marble will roll down the side of the bowl, down, 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 and eventually it will come to rest in the lowest energy state, which is the bottom of the bowl. That's precisely my model of human history. And the, the, now, bear in mind what the competition is peddling. The competition is peddling the idea that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment for no reason. 
Now, whatever you think about that, notice that it's the limit case for credulity. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, if you believe, if you can believe that, I, it's hard for me to imagine what you would balk at. If we were to sit down and say, let's see who can think of the most unlikely thing that could possibly happen, I submit to you, nobody could top the Big Bang. It is the improbability of improbabilities. It is the improbability, it is the mother of all improbabilities right there. So I'm suggesting something different. I'm suggesting that the universe is pulled toward a complex attractor that exists ahead of us in time and that our ever accelerating speed through the phenomenal world of connectivity and novelty is based on the fact that we are now very, very close to the attractor. All Western religions have insisted that God would come tangential to history, but they all lose their nerve when you ask when, which is the only interesting question about that hypothesis. I mean, if it's not now, then what the hell difference does it make? It's just pissing in the wind as far as I can see. Uh, I think that the very real social crisis that is upon us, the crisis of population, of resource depletion, of atmospheric degradation, of epidemic disease, all these crises indicate that we are now down to the short epochs of this process of universal ingression into novelty, and that in fact it makes no sense whatsoever to speak of a human future. There is no human future. It's inconceivable, given where we are today, that to speak of the human world a thousand years from now, or 500 years from now, it is literally, it either doesn't exist, or it's beyond our power of imagining. It isn't simply going to be non-polluting cars and smaller hi-fi speakers. I mean, that's an idiot's notion. Uh, yeah, clearer TV pictures uh, and stuff. It isn't like that at all. I mentioned this this morning, how when you look at only one line of technological development, automobiles or computers, it looks like you can rationally anticipate what's going to happen. But when you realize that there are thousands of these lines of development all transforming themselves, all moving towards some kind of omega point, then you realize that we're in the grip of what I call a concrescence. And I maintain that you don't have to believe me on this. You can see it from here. You just have to climb a high hill. There's one, it's called psilocybin. There's one, it's called ayahuasca. The view from the tops of these hills is of the concrescence.